Good morning, good morning, good morning. I pray and hope that the Lord has met you today with a smile and that you are enjoying the reign of his blessings and mercy on your life right now as we speak. Good morning. My name is Paul Turner. I'm with the Park Windsor Baptist Church, and I thank you so much for tuning in this morning to watch our Sunday School, our General Assembly course this Sunday morning. Today we're going to talk about the presence and presence of God, coming mainly from Acts 3, 1 through 12. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today just thanking you one more time for giving us another chance, dear Lord, to share your word, to fellowship, to give to others, and to find ways for us to make your word apply to our lives. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are less than us, who have less than we do. We pray for those who have more than we do. We pray for anyone who is out of the ark, out of the ark of safety, dear Lord, and we ask that you send us to those that need be so they can say, so when they say, what must I do to be saved, we can show them the way. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to have prayers over our church, our sick and shut-in list. Pray for our pastor as he continues to reach, teach, and transform lives. And now, Lord, we ask that we can focus on the word of God so we may find something in your truth that will help us live another day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you again. Again, we're going to be speaking today on the presence and presence of God coming from Acts 3, 1 through 12. Uh, I hope you have a blessing out of this message because I certainly got one. I was planning on teaching something entirely different and God and the Holy Spirit took me somewhere else. What we're going to talk about today is God's presence is a gift. God's presence is a gift. God's presence to us is the Holy Spirit. God's presence to us is the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is both his presence and his present. God's Holy Spirit is both his presence and his present. God's Holy Spirit gives us gifts also. God's Holy Spirit gives us gifts also. And finally, God's gifts to us are not to be kept, but they're to be shared with God's people. Amen? So at the end of this lesson, we're going to show you an example to do that. We're going to show you what those things mean, and hopefully and prayerfully you'll get something out of this to move forward in your day. God has wanted to be in our presence since the very beginning, since he created the Garden of Eden, since he created Adam. He has wanted to be in our presence. The Bible says that he came down in the cool of the evening to meet with Adam. And so after he, he, he also created him and he gave him things to do, told him to manage the garden, and he wanted to fellowship with Adam the entire time. He made his presence known even after Adam and, and Eve were thrown out of the garden. God made his presence known to his people in the Old Testament. Several examples of that. The example of when he led his people out of Egypt, he led them with a pillar of smoke in the day and a pillar of fire at night. The the clouds and the smoke and the fire that appeared when he brought Moses up to Mount Sinai to give him the, 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 the rules and the Ten Commandments. God was always there. He always wanted to be with us. God's presence is essential in our relationship with him. When we come to God, it is our duty to try to learn more and more about him. Just as with any relationship, once you start that relationship, when you met your spouse or met your best friend, one of the main things you did was try to learn more about them, try to find more ways for you guys to be together. That's the same way we should be pursuing God in, in our relationship with him because it's essential that we know him so we know how to serve him and we know how he wants us to be, he wants us to. So today let's look at God's presence and his presence that he gave to the apostles, the disciples, and to all that believe in him. The early church, as described in Acts, was founded on the life, trial, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was present with the disciples, and all the experiential lessons that he taught them 
were what he wanted them to use as he told them to move forward and give and gave them the great commission. Acts also tells us that the disciples were equipped with the Holy Spirit, God's presence to us, that descended upon them on the day of the Pentecost. So what I'm saying here is that the entire time that God was with the apostles, he was teaching them who he was, training them on what he wanted them to do through example and through teaching. The demonstrations of the healing of, pe of folks, the healing of the blind, the healing of the sick, how he showed compassion, even when he was being persecuted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even when he was pressed upon in different crowds and someone was reaching out to him, he showed compassion and made sure that everyone knew that God was a God of love. And he always was about his father's business. He did this to be an example to the apostles because soon and very soon after his death, God had charged them to do the very same thing. And now I keep saying God because God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. So please don't get it uh, confused that, or think that I'm confused. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They all three are different, but they're all three the same. They're all three one. So as we go through our conversation, I'm, 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 I will probably inter interpose those a couple of times. And interpose is a new word that I just made up. So before we start going into um, Acts, let me just give you another example of how Jesus prepared the disciples to do what he needed them to do. If you go with me to Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20, that's Matthew, verse 28, verse 16 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. And the New King James Version reads, Then the eleven disciples went away to, into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Right there we have an example of God's presence with man. It says that as the, the 11 disciples were on that mountain, that Jesus came to them. He appeared to them, and they worshiped him, although a couple of them doubted. But Jesus spoke to them in saying, he told them what had happened. Because you now remember at the Last Supper, he told them what was going to happen. And now he's telling them what has happened. He hasn't seen them since the Lord's Supper in a group like this. And so now he's telling, well, I take that back. He has seen them because he told them to go to this mountain. So he's, he's talking to them and letting them know that I am God. And I have done my father's business and my father has given me all authority, all powers in my hands. And now I need you guys to go and tell my story. I need you to go, therefore, and not only tell my story, but I need you to make disciples. I need you to tell my story in a way that they will believe and be confirmed and be, 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 be transformed into disciples. So Jesus prepared us to go ye therefore. His pouring into the lives of the disciples by calling them from their lives of fishing, tax collecting, and medicine, showing them he was the son of God, Pouring, to in, pouring into them through sermons like the Sermon on the Mount and all the examples and demonstrations of the blessing that he was able to do with the, father, with the power of his, of his Father God, as well as preparing them for his death and resurrection. And he is God as well, so he knew also that we would need more. And then right after he told them to go ye therefore, he told them to go back to the upper room and wait for the next gift, and that gift would be the Holy Spirit. If we move now to Acts 2, 1 through 4, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. So we've already seen and know that God was present with the disciples and the apostles. He allowed them to see him work every day. He allowed them to see him teach in the synagogues. He allowed them to see him heal. He allowed them to see him uh, 
rebuked those who did not know that he had come to fulfill the law. And then after his death and resurrection, he told them to go ye therefore and make disciples. But he told them not to go until he prepared them finally. And, he, and on, in Acts 2 and 1, the next gift from God came. Acts 2 and 1 reads, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as, a, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this, this example of tongues, these young men began to speak the languages of all the people that surrounded them in the city that they were in. This sea was the city that they were in was a seaport. It was a busy commerce. It had it had merchants coming from all over the world in them, from China, from Africa, from Cameroon, from everywhere. And these people spoke a different language. And this this uh, um, this empowerment by the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to speak in those tongues, the native tongues of those people that were around them, so that those people could hear in their own native tongue the word of God the story of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Amen? So this, this gift not only emboldened the, the apostles, but it gave them the power to communicate to those that the Lord would have them communicate. And as we know, Peter stood up and gave a wonderful sermon that converted thousands. He first told them that these are not the utterings of, of drunken men. Told them that it was early in the morning that's, that they weren't drunk. But these men were showing the true awesome power of God and the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, of whom we now believe and we believe you should believe. And then he went back to the scriptures from Genesis to the present day to tell them the story of Jesus Christ, to let them know that in their, in their scriptures, in, their, in their, the, 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 the scrolls that they were reading, the man that was prophesied in those scriptures had come, and they had missed him. Not only did they miss him, they rejected him. Not only did they reject him, we know that they punished him, and they killed him. But Peter stood up to tell them that even with all of that, that Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, had given them another chance to accept Jesus Christ and have salvation. Hallelujah. Now, when this happened, there was, it was more than just a happening. What, what, what is beautiful about the Bible is everything in the Bible confirms what was happening before, the prophecies. So if you go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 17, Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 18, you'll find the following. Exodus chapter 19 verses 16 through 18. Here the Lord reveals himself to his people. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain on the same of the trumpet was very loud. So at all the people who were in the camp trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So it was already prophesied that God would reveal himself to his people. And he did it again here in Acts 2 and 1. And also another prophecy that was fulfilled, if you go to Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 reads as follows. Then, after doing all these things, I'm sorry, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Joel is telling us exactly what, happened, what was going to happen in Acts. Two and one. That is exactly what happened right there. God 
poured out his spirit on man. So you see, this, this pouring of the Holy Spirit wasn't something that God just thought of and did on this particular day. It was planned and thought out from the beginning. And also one other time is when his own John the Baptist in Luke 3.16, in Luke 3.16, John the Baptist tells everyone, look, um, John the Baptist tells us that I, I baptized, John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, who shall, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So again, we, we know that the scriptures have told us that Jesus was coming and told us that he was going to empower his disciples to do what he had them to do. And we already see the power that the, that the Holy Spirit gave to Peter, the confidence the understanding to be able to speak and, 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 and tell the folks what was really going on so they could all hear in their own, their own tongue the word of Jesus Christ. But there's more. We've talked about the presence of God, and we've talked about a present of God, which was the Holy Spirit. But isn't it nice when you get a gift and you open the gift and it's got more gifts inside? Oh, I don't know about y'all, but that's nice to me. When I can open up one box and it's got another box inside of that box and another box inside of that box, oh, man, praise the Lord. Now, you guys may not understand what I'm saying, but I love gifts that keep on giving. Well, the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. What, what are you asking does the Holy Spirit give? Well, if you go to Galatians 5.22, if you go to Galatians 5.22, it'll tell you that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. Let me share again. The, the Holy Spirit is a gift from God. And the Holy Spirit came to the world with gifts of its own. It's like being invited to someone's uh, housewarming party. And you're there plus one. They brought a gift, but guess what? You are the kind of person that brought a gift too. So you brought a gift as well. And then when you got there, you're having a great time. And, oh, man, the people who are giving the party give you a gift. That's what I'm talking about. And the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is, is, is a plentiful gift. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's long-suffering. That's patience, y'all. It's kindness. It's goodness, which is different than goodness and kindness are different, right? It's faithfulness. It's gentleness. It's self-control. These are all the things that we need to witness for Christ because people are not going to listen to you. People are going to want to debate you. People are going to want to argue the word with you. People are going to want to just say you're crazy and get out of my face. And you have to demonstrate these gifts that the fruit that, that come from the spirit of God. So he's given us to, to this Holy Spirit to guide us. For those of you who are utilizing the Holy Spirit, you, you, you hear it as that, that small, still voice that tells you, now you know good and well, you don't need to be going over there doing that. And sometimes it's that, that thing that makes life slow down while you avoid an accident or where it, it makes the light that was just about to turn green, turn red again, and a car speeds through the intersection. Or is that thing that, that, that you actually hear someone yell when you look up and you see someone standing in, in, in the way of your car and you, you're able to move out of the way? All that is the Holy Spirit. It's that also that small, still voice that tells you this person is the one you're supposed to give money to. This person is the one I want you to show kindness to. This person is the one I want you to do something good for. All that is the Holy Spirit. It's that when you're in that bed on Sunday, you, particularly now during this 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 pandemic, Sunday morning is a whole different belt. It's a whole different ball game. Instead of getting up at six thirty and showering and shaving and preparing to leave and come to church, many of us are just rolling over at seven fifty eight and opening up our phone, turning on our our computer. And even with that, some of us are are not even doing that. We're just rolling over, period, and not doing anything. The Holy Spirit is what's telling you, saying. Don't you want to hear about me today? 
Don't you want to learn something new about me today? That's the Holy Spirit. We have to be attentive to the Holy Spirit. It gives us gifts. It helps us complete the task that we need. And with all the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us, there's nothing that's not touched. There's nothing that we can't do because it gives us something to do all the things that we need to do. God's presence and God's presence. God is a gift. Now, now here's the, the most important part. God's gift, God's gifts are not for you to keep. They're not for you to keep. They're not for you to put up on your shelf and show everybody. They're not for you to put in the closet and wait for the special time to wear them. They're not for you to hold on till Thanksgiving and break them out with the good china. God's gifts are to be shared with others. He gives them to you so you can give to others. That See, see that's the, the part of the gift giving that we don't understand. That's sort of new to us. You mean to tell me I got to give my gift away? You know, when you went to kindergarten and had that lesson about sharing? <laughs> sharing? Did you bring enough for the class? Right? So God gives us these gifts to be shared with others. And the, the best example of that, or not the best, but one that really warms my heart is in Acts 3, 1 through 12. Acts 3, 1 through 12, where Peter and John meet the crippled beggar at the beautiful gate of the synagogue. This is a great story. Now, Peter and John, Acts 3. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms for those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, before I read this next part, I just want to share something very dear to my heart. This next, uh, this next verse uh, was written to me in the front page of a Bible that my mother gave me before I was studying the word. She gave me this word, and she gave me this, that scripture in the Bible. And I did not recognize, I did not know what it meant at the time, but I'm telling you, thank you, Mom, for letting me know that the word of God is, is a gift in itself. So when Peter, when, when, when the guy looked up at Peter and asked him for the alms, Peter in verse 5 says, so he says, so he gave him his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leapingly stood up and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking, leaping, and praising God. So see, let me just share with you. Peter and John have been in the presence of Jesus. Peter and John had received the present of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John had received all of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John knew that the gifts were not to be kept, but to be shared. And they shared it with the lame beggar at the temple a beautiful at the beautiful gate and oh by the way look how quickly the beggar learned his lesson it says he walking leaping and praising God so he too knew that the gift was not to be kept let me just give you some information about how strategic this really is to the word of God see back in those days the Jews they came to temple three times a day they came at nine in the morning they came at three in the afternoon and they would come at sunset. And now, and these were devout, the devout Jews would come there and the Gentiles who believed in God would come as well. So the Jews allowed you to come and listen to their religion, but you couldn't be one. Amen. But there were those who understood and were still following because they knew that the Jews were what? God's chosen people. 
So they wanted to be close. They wanted to be in the house. Now, imagine 9 a.m. You got, you got your early risers. You got your afternoon folks. You got your evening folks. Which one of them think you think has the most, has the most, the, the, which, which session do you think was attended the most? That three o'clock session. Because remember, this society was mostly farmers. They couldn't come in the morning. They were working, harvesting and planting and watering and all that, milking the cows and stuff. That afternoon one was right on time because many of them had to get back before sunset to do all the work at the house. So that three o'clock uh, session was the biggest one. And this, this, this beggar had positioned himself. And, and remember, it says that someone had walked him, someone had put him there. So he, he, was, he was smart. He said, no, don't put me there in the morning. Put me there at three. We'll get what we're going to get, and then we can eat dinner and, and go to bed and be ready for the next day. So he was there for the biggest one. And now also, the, the synagogue had several entrances. The Bible says that the gate of beautiful was one of the most popular gates to use. It was, it is, it was in fact, a beautiful gate as a descriptor but it was actually called beautiful as well. So he's standing in the main gate during the main service asking for money. So he, he was positioned to get as much money as a beggar could get. It's, it's like when you see the guy standing at Fatburger at lunchtime. He's probably going to get more money at Fatburger at lunchtime than he is in the morning or in the evening. He was ready. Now, also, let me share, with, share this with you, was that giving money to the poor was considered praiseworthy in the Jewish religion. So the beggar had chose very wisely because not only were there more people to choose from, but the Jewish religion had, had asked them and, and had rewarded folks for giving, giving alms to the poor. So you've got these folks, some are very devout and they're giving it for the right reasons. Others are giving it for show. You know how it goes. But he was getting the money. So he was getting alms. And then and, and, and when Peter and John walked in, when Peter and John walked in, now see, they walked in to do business. They walked in to go and preach and teach at one of the rooms in the synagogue. See, the synagogue had many rooms to teach in. It's sort of like a Sunday school when, when churches go into Sunday school. You got the, the, the men and you got the women and you got women's too. You got the youth and young adults. You got the the the, the, the the, uh, the babies and the teenagers. So there are all kinds of rooms to go in. And Peter and John were going into one of those rooms to preach. They weren't even sure which room they were going to go into. But here's how the Holy Spirit and the presence and presence of God work. Peter and John had been prepared because they had been in the presence of Jesus. Peter and John had been prepared because they had been given the present of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John were prepared because they knew what the gifts of the Spirit were. And so it was easy for them to enact on what they had learned and what they were taught when the beggar asked for alms. But here's the beauty of what happened. Since Peter and John were looking at the beggar as God will look at you, instead of giving the beggar what he wanted, Peter and John gave him what he needed. Let me say that again. Instead of giving the beggar what he wanted, which was some, a, a, a couple of alms to eat that night, Peter and John looked at him with the heart of God and gave him what he needed, was salvation and healing. Do you think that that beggar would choose salvation and healing over a couple of alms? He had been lame since he was born. You think he'd rather walk or get a couple of shackles? And it says, silver and gold I have none, but such as I have, the have I give in the name of Christ Jesus. Rise and walk. Now here's how the, the gift of the Spirit keeps on giving. Because the crippled man got up leaping and praising the, praising the Lord, and he, and he went into the temple with them. And the scripture says in 9, Acts 3, verse 9, it says, And all the people saw, saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar, the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. 
King James Version says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who said, begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And you know what that did? That made them come and gather around. And so now instead of Peter talking to a small group of people in one room, the, the Bible says that the entire Solomon's colonnade came out to see what was going on. And again, Peter utilizing the strength and the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit spoke to them, spoke the word of God to them. And even though at the, at the end of their presentation, they were actually held and put in, put in captivity for overnight, the Bible says approximately 5,000 men were saved because the gift of the Holy Spirit has gifts of its own that keep giving and giving. And once you understand the true practice of how to get a gift, not keep a gift, and share that gift with others, it continues to multiply. And that's what God built. That, that's how God built the process of building his church. He needed us to receive the gift and share the gift. And that's what Peter and John did. So I told you at the beginning of our lesson that I was going to talk to you about God's presence, presence being a gift. When we call in the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be in the room, to follow with us, to give us the strength to do these things, we are literally calling for God to be with us. And when God is with us, who can be against us? When we look to the hills from which our strength comes, when we understand the power of salvation and healing, we know truly that the word of God is correct when it says there's no weapon formed that can defeat us. I also said that by the end of this lesson, you will understand that God's present to us was the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit. It said there, right there in the scripture that when the disciples saw him, as he was getting ready to arise, he told them that I'm going to send you something. You go wait for it. And when you get it, I need you to go out, go ye there for and make disciples. But don't do it until it comes. And that gift came to them. That day of Pentecost came to them. And it's so beautiful because it acted right away. Didn't have to add water to it. Didn't have to add salt and pepper and put some greens with it or nothing. It came down and descended upon them and touched each one of them in that room. And immediately they were able to speak the word of God as they had been trained through their presence with Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. But the Holy Spirit gave them the opportunity to teach that word in a native tongue of someone else so that they too could hear and come to God. I also told you that God's Holy Spirit is both his presence and his present. We know that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three separate, but all three one. So if you call the Holy Spirit to be with you, you have called God to be with you, and you are in his presence. And then I told you that the Holy Spirit gives gifts also. We talked about them. Love, faithfulness, joy, kindness, goodness, patience, all those things the Holy Spirit gave us on top of being a gift from God. But here's what I need you to, to work out and start practicing. And for those of you who are already practicing, I need you to practice it more. That God's gifts are not for you to keep. God's gifts are to be shared with others. Not only other Christians, not only other folks that you're walking on the journey with, but others outside the ark of safety. God's gifts are to be shared with them so that all men can be presented the opportunity to have salvation and be saved in their life. And that is our job. We are the men and women who are supposed to go ye therefore. We're not supposed to wait for the pastor or wait for the evangelist or wait for someone else. 
If you're someplace and you're wondering why no one's doing anything, it's because God sent you, and he's waiting for you to do it. He's waiting for you to share the gifts he's put in you already. When you accepted him, when you, when you stood up and, and, and mouthed those words that you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, and you joined the church, at that same time, the Holy Spirit came upon you. Now, it may have taken a little bit of time for you to realize that it was there, but it's there. And when it's time to go into action, the Holy Spirit will jump before you and bring you along if you allow it. So the God's gifts are not to be kept, but to be shared. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for another lesson. We pray, Lord, that this lesson was received with the intent that you gave to enhance and edify your kids, your children, to make others stronger, to, to if anyone who's out of the ark of safety that, that have heard this, to let them ask, what must they do to be saved? They can call the church number. They can call me directly. They can call any Christian that they know to be saved, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be used in your spirit and used in your, in your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After yours, <laughs> right after yours. <laughs>